It's a beautiful show as we admire the winner of the 2020 Car Design Award. We conclude our three-part Aston Martin special by going top-down in the beautiful DBS. And we meet the team behind Drifari. So they may not be beautiful, but the locations and the production on their show certainly is. Another week, another dose of motoring on full boost. Welcome to Motor Driven. Now, I hope you found last week's show really helpful. I know I learned a thing or two from Howard regarding my rights as a motorist here in South Africa. For me, the key take home, be informed and be aware. But let's get on to this week's show. It is all about the celebration of beauty and car design. Unveiled to the world in November 2019, the Roma marked a departure from the styling language we've become accustomed to from Maranello. Fabio Manzoni and his team at the Ferrari Styling Center went back to the 60s for inspiration, to the iconic 250 GT Lusso and that pleasurable way of life that the Italian capital exuded, and they reinterpreted it as a modern, authentic 2 plus coupe. The interior is set out like a dual cockpit, with the driver and passenger separated by a center console, which integrates seamlessly into the dashboard. There is digital instrumentation, a central touchscreen, with the option of a third screen integrated on the passenger side. And it's the refined, timeless design that saw the Roma awarded the prestigious Car Design Award. The expert panel of judges felt that the Roma reinterprets the classical lines of a Gran Turismo car and projects them into the 21st century, thanks to sensual, evocative and cutting-edge design. And who are we to argue with that? The Roma is powered by their award-winning F154 3.9-litre twin-turbo V8, and it positions itself between the Portofino and the F8 Tributo in the Ferrari stable. From an Italian masterpiece to the best of British, we conclude our Aston Martin tour with the ultimate production car in their lineup, the DBS, a sculptured machine that is the epitome of how beauty can be a beast. that imposing oxygen guzzling hexagonal grill that feeds the beast, the aeroblade slashes, the sills, splitters and double diffusers that are dominant in their duality, a real manifestation of purposeful design and engineering. The interior is all about superb materials and quality finishings, but they do mask an interior layout and design that does need an update. Aston Martin's description of their creation remains the best, beautifully brutal. Back in the day, it was intended as the successor to the DB6 as a larger coupe with four full seats. Instead, the two were both available until it finally got the V8 engine for which it was always intended in 1969. Now, at the time, it was the fastest four-seater production car in the world, so obviously James Bond needed it on Her Majesty's Secret Service. In 1972, it was simply renamed the Aston Martin V8. It was the last car developed under David Brown before being reborn in 2007, this time as a V12. In June 2018, they unveiled this, the DBS Superleggera as their flagship V12 Grand Tourer, replacing the Vanquish and also paying tribute to the Italian automobile coach builder who helped Aston Martin develop their lightest GT cars in the 60s. The performance from this 5.2 litre twin turbo V12 is, well, otherworldly. 533 kilowatts, 900 newton meters, all driving the rear wheels. Can you imagine unleashing all of that performance on those narrow English country roads? <laughs> well, that's exactly what I did. Finally, I get behind the wheel of what has got to be one of 
the hottest looking cars I've seen in a long time. Proportions amazing, but we're not here to talk about looks. We've done that. From a driving perspective, great setup, very, very comfortable. And even though the seats are luxurious, they still are providing you with lots of bolsters. So you realize this car got a nice fitted suit, but underneath it, it's all rippled muscle. Probably gonna be something quite special. The buttons are perfectly positioned from a driving perspective. I don't have to look for the performance buttons down here in the center cluster on the wheel, fully driver focused. So S button, I can put it into into S mode or Sport Plus, so I've selected that. And then on the left side, I can go from GT mode into Sport and Sport Plus as well. And that really just changes the suspension setup and the compliance of the vehicle. I can, in actual fact, be cruising in comfort mode as a brilliant GT that this is, a super GT, and still have the good soundtrack. And I think that's gonna be quite popular. So I like the fact that two personalities are kept separate. Oh, wow. <laughs> Bloody hell. Brutish the way it delivers its force. In a time where people are saying, oh, small combustion engines are the way to go, Aston Martin have stuck to their guns with a V12. And that soundtrack is just absolutely glorious. This engine is a thing of beauty. 5.2 litre V12 twin turbo. Uh, if, if I wasn't so busy behind the wheel, I'd be clapping hands now. And we're talking crazy speeds, 340 kilometers an hour, 0 to 100 in uh, 3.6 seconds. That, that is blisteringly fast. Equally impressive, they've got an eight-speed ZF box in here. You get into dynamic mode now and start working your way through the paddles, and it's actually unbelievable how responsive it is. But look at the turn-in. This is a, a big car, Un unbelievable, and it's just so crisp on the front end. I get what they're saying, turning up in a fine tailored suit, because that is what it is. But my goodness me, personality change, uh, bipolar, completely. This is an incredible piece of machinery. And to put that performance in perspective, besides the significant jump up in power compared with the engine in the DB11, the DBS weighs nearly 200 kilograms less thanks to the extensive use of carbon fiber. Opting for the Volante with its roof mechanism almost cancels out that weight saving though. It can also generate 180 kilograms of downforce thanks to the F1 inspired double diffuser. This is the highest ever for production Aston Martin. And trust me, you are going to need it. But then at the turn of the dial, it's an elegant, refined GT. Yes, it is pricier than the Bentley Continental GT, which is the better all-round GT. But it is the DBS you're going to hunger to drive again and again. Oh, and I would go for the Volante. Now, I never had the fact that I wasn't a fan of the earlier Aston Martins. For me, I just felt there was very little to distinguish between the different models, and they never quite lived up to that Aston Martin heritage. But that all changed with the models that they started producing as part of their second century plan. Vehicles that suddenly, with Marek Reichmann and his design team, had unique character styled into each one of them, and dynamically very, very difficult to fault. But for me, the fact that they continue to produce V12 engines and haven't succumbed to the pressure of driving all four wheels, it's advantage Aston Martin. With 900 new meters of torque driving the rear wheels, this is the car you are going to have no problem getting sideways. And that is something our guests on this week's show have no problem doing. You know that feeling you get deep inside your bones when you find a curvy road? forces you to smile. That feeling that drives you to push yourself to be better. That drives you to exceed your very own expectations. That's what we crave. We're on a mission. 
we're on an adventure. What happened at dinner? This is Drift Farm. Can I just say, unfreaking believable. That was epic storytelling, and I don't think it was your doing or your doing, Mike. I know no. you two choppers long enough. James? <laughs> Thank you. Round of applause, <laughs> bud. Proud of that? I am, yeah. Was it? Hell of a lot of work, so I'm really, really stoked with it. We're going to get into sense. what went on behind the scenes because I've worked with these guys. I've played rugby with Mike for long enough, so Say now the chaos that goes on. Jim, this is something very different, and it was kind of forced upon you guys from a COVID perspective, thinking out the box. Yeah, you've got SA Drift Series. You guys have been running it for how many years? 10 years, 10, 11 years. Now suddenly you can't, no events? No events, no, uh, can't do anything. But there was that little loophole. You know, you always have to try and look for opportunity. So we saw uh, you could do productions, you could do some filming, and we've done a couple of things for TVs and, and, and TV adverts and, and movies, but we had to give back to our sponsors. You know, they've, they've sponsored, we lost nearly half of our sponsorship because guys pulled out, they didn't want to do anything. And for the rest of the guys, we're like, oh, we need to do something. And, and Mike came into my office the one day and said, that's it, we've got to do something, we're going to go, we're going to go on safari. So I'm like, that sounds pretty cool, but we, we can't call it Safari. And then Driftfari was born. And uh, we wanted to give back to our sponsors and partners that have helped us. But we wanted to do something different. You've seen movies and you've seen TV shows, Top Gear, Gas Monkey. We wanted to take the little bits of all of those that make it really mm. cool and plug it into one type of little series. And we wanted to showcase our beautiful country. I mean, it was yeah. incredible. And just have fun doing it, you know? We've always decided to have fun whenever we do stuff. And I think James, when he first came on board, the first couple of meetings was very prim and proper and <laughs> was trying to get things done. And yes, we'll do it this way and we'll do it that way. First day of production, <laughs> just get it done. Throw the rule book yeah. out the window. But hang on, let's, let's, let's put it in perspective. You guys are still super organized, Mikey. And that's where you come in. I mean, I'm, I'm quite surprised. Our days of playing rugby together, you were all over the place, but you <laughs> <laughs> try, to, try to play scrub I on. I one in the gut. <laughs> but very organized, because putting something like this together, massive logistics. Closing Golden Gate for you guys to go and drift through a, a national park. Um, the harbor, all those sort of sequences. You, you the paperwork, jumping through the hoops guy. I think we were, we kind of had an idea and a schedule in our minds, but it was putting that all together. Once you were on the road, the schedule went, yeah. you know, for a ball of, you know. Yeah. Inside. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, each stop had its own challenges, but we were able to jump over those hurdles. And, uh, you know, I think uh, going in to visit the people who were responsible to give us the permissions was always the big mm. thing, you know, and always the, the little hook in the mouth so we could convince them. But it did take a bit of effort, it took a bit of money to get some of the permissions yeah. uh, passed and greenlit. And then once you had done that, we were able to negotiate with the metro, with the guys to close the roads when we needed them closed. And but so everyone, and so when we did do it, everyone was super excited. Yeah. Uh, when we went to uh, Sand Parks, it was jumping a lot, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to leave behind? What's your footprint? What's your, yeah. what's your green footprint? Fair questions. Yeah, you know, and when, when they say to drifters that burn rubber, yeah. what's, what's your, your green <laughs> footprint? And like, um, it's black. Um, <laughs> we're going to leave some marks. Black um, lines. Black lines, lines yeah. yeah. But it was, uh, you know, once we got there and they could see Sorry, that we that were... a bumper sticker? <laughs> <laughs> Once they saw that we were, we were dead serious and we were wanting to get this done and we were wanting to showcase this incredible countryside, um, everyone from, from national parks to Inanda to even racetracks were going, mm. no charge, yeah. come. We can I see think, you guys just want to do yeah, stuff. It had never been done before. Never it was been something done. that was like uh, fresh. 
So I think they were more open to it. When we said to the guys, we're bringing drip, drift cars up this mountain pass, they're like, no ways, man. Just look well, off the cliff. They're four car carcasses. He's not lying. You're crazy. I, I look just, off the cliff I'm, and there's <laughs> four carcasses. <But laughs> so I, I just scary. think negotiation in future. Strap the guy into the car and then, <laughs> and then, and then have that conversation. Because I've seen you talk yeah. and drive. Have that conversation with him while you are hanging the car precariously off a cliff. Yeah. He's always going to say yes just to get out <laughs> of the car. The I think the bonus was that most people didn't know what drifting was essentially yeah. by definition. They and just thought it was a program. whole bunch of cars coming up in yeah. a motorcade up a mountain pass. You know, They didn't know it. It's yeah. new. It's just fresh. You know, so. It gave us a little bit more to negotiate and play with. So once they saw it, they were like, oh, maybe <laughs> there won't be a next time. <laughs> no, but uh, I'm pretty sure there's going to be because th this is my thing. Next year, COVID back to normal, hopefully, and we can have events and it's starting to get there. SA Drift Series is going to run again, but I'm sure there's going to be Drift Fari too because the storytelling that came out of it, I mean, you can't, you can't leave it there. No, no sure. I don't think we will. We've already started planning. But James uh, is looking very happy about James that. James is very <laughs> excited. Can I have seven months off? <laughs> Let, let's talk about the nightmare of working with these guys because they are so full of energy, so infectious. And you've got Eric the Viking. I mean, Stacy was there. You've got some really big personalities, but really easy guys to film. To put a camera on them, there's going to be good content. But what a nightmare from an editing perspective because you've got tons, gigs of cuck that you've got to kind of wade through. So what did you say? Yeah. Because his term was... <laughs> Cack. A metric shit ton. A metric a shit ton. <laughs> Literally. Shit ton. First, night, first night we've been filming and he's sitting there and he's listening to us talking and Ryan and he starts loosening up and he just sits, sits there going, guys, first day and I've got a metric shit ton of content. <laughs> we could literally make six episodes out of the first two days. <laughs> but how, how, how do you wade through that? Because, I mean, I was on the shoot with you guys when you were in PE. Only two of you. I mean, what you've pulled off here is, is, is amazing. I mean, how, what's your process wading through all that stuff? And did you have a clear idea of how each episode would run? So one of the, one of the biggest like, bits of advice that I got when I started filming was while you're shooting, edit. Edit in your mind. So you, mm. you're piecing things together while you're shooting. So I was doing that the whole time. So when I got to the editing table and started editing at my desk, like literally everything, I had my, my goal in my mind. The difficult shooting. Part, yeah, well, we did, but <laughs> we, 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 we have enough content to back ourselves up if, if my idea did not work. Yeah. The difficult part was, this was the first time I've ever had a second shooter on board with such a large proje project. And now his mind frame is not exactly the same as mine. So I don't know what his shots look like. So that, that for editing, most of the time it's me going through his footage and choosing out the best parts of his footage. But with mine, I kind of had a rough idea on, yeah. on what I had in the in the in See, my story because yeah. that is difficult because you can almost end up saying listen i must send shoot to cover for him because i don't know what he's going to get but you've mm. got to trust him to do his job 100%. and have that brief but and still to major trust issues so yeah. it was difficult <laughs> but still to put to put all that stuff together uh, in, incredible highlight for you out of all of that some of my best cinematic moments wasn't the the most fun part and the most fun part wasn't the most um difficult part and we had some challenges breaking down both our cars on Inanda Pass just breaking down. But while the crew and it's boiling hot, and Mike and I are standing there going, look at this, on the side of a mountain, overlooking Inanda Dam. <laughs> two broken drift cars. <laughs> two broken drift cars, guys frantically putting cars back together. James up top going, how long are you guys gonna take on the radio? And Mike and I just calmly knowing that shit's gonna happen. Yeah. The, th the guys are gonna put it together, we're gonna make this happen. I think that, so I say there's different reactions for me during the time I had I'm sure you've got cinematic which Moments. was amazing and and certain times where it's like and it was one of the hardest times our cars are broken we don't have to make the sun's going down uh, the clouds are coming over but it was probably one of the most awesome little times I'm like this is amazing on the side of a mountain overlooking a dam in KZ and, and we drifting the mountain pass and then I had the same thing in PE at the harbour overlooking the beautiful clouds rolling in and some incredible incredible beautiful pictures you're actually making me want to cry i've never seen a soft <laughs> i've never seen a soft gentle side shut up Dick. <laughs> okay james i've just managed to dry the tears thanks jim be be beautiful moment don't leave me hanging uh -huh. oh sorry <laughs> be yours um, highlight probably desi raceway um we got the camera car set up with the rig on the front now we we've always been we've always struggled with it on the front and i couldn't figure out why eventually we figured out it needed more weight 
to kind of push the shock down and then it operated. So finally we weighed it down on the front and we got it right. So myself and Lawrence were kind of shooting, chasing the cars, but now on a 1.6 caddy chasing a drift car around desert, it's not gonna work. So eventually Jim was like, no, I wanna try. So I'm like, okay, all right, cool, let's go. So we eventually figured out that we could park in different spots and as they came drifting around, we could join in. Mm. Now, I personally, timing, eh? I, I wouldn't do it because I don't know the, I don't know what their cars are going to do, but with Jim knowing what they're going to do and how they're going to react, we, we, we nailed it. Like in the shots, like after we watched it, we both just started laughing and gave each other a half five. You, you showed me that when we were in PE. It's in your promo video. It is so mm. sweet. But I mean, talk us through that rig as well, because, you know, you can go and rent these special vehicles that have been converted to, but you've just taken your car and done some modifications that work for you. So a car rig has been something I've wanted from day one. I don't know why, I can't tell you why, it's just been what I've wanted from the get-go. So eventually I found that you don't have to buy a four million rand crane to have a car rig. There are cheaper options and I found this little arm that you attach to the front of your car and it's actually manufactured in India. You have to pretty much build like a bull bar on the front of your car to attach a, a vertical pole. So I went to Mark and Jim and I'm like, guys, can you help out here? Like, I need help here. And they're like, no, cool, we can do it. So they did the whole bull bar story it was like seven days delayed, but it's fun. And Not like we, him, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and it was really well constructed. It was pretty well constructed. We put our top guy on there. <laughs> um, so it, it worked, and it worked like a champ. So we, we faced some issues. Obviously, it's a completely new style of shooting, yeah. and it's got to get used to the remotes and everything. So, ugh, but I mean, after three or four days of using it, we were pretty. But that's what's cool. That's what's cool with this because it comes across. I mean, obviously, I understand the production, the behind-the-scenes thing, so I know what you guys are doing. Mm -hmm. But for a guy watching it, he goes, "Yes, it's awesome." Not understanding how that was achieved. So it's great work on your side. Great driving as well. So also, good, how good. many people laughed at me when I drove onto Clarkstorp track with a bloody caddy? <laughs> <laughs> caddy and a, <laughs> it was so. Yeah, but. Um, uh, I, <laughs> We drive behind him, and, him, and I can see, see the back off. wheel lifting around the corner. Around the corner, the weight so, on. Yeah, the... I'm drifting, and I'm going, and I'm putting my car maybe 30 centimeters from the camera, and I can see Lawrence in the back screaming, <laughs> shouting for him to go faster. He's shouting, go, go, go! And I can't turn the traction control off in the caddy. The traction control's <laughs> kicking in, and I'm like, please just go, like. So yeah, we had, we had we had good fun trying to mm. find the little middle ground of what we can and yeah. can't do in that first week, and then just it just it picked up. It just picked up momentum and, and we just, we had fun. You, we just you, had a you, you, you did. I'm going to get to my fun times with you guys. Your favorite moment? I don't think it was one. I think, uh, I think the, there were day sunset moments where um, in the sand park in uh, near Harry Smith, we had a beautiful shot of Stacy spinning on a skid pan. Basically, it was like a cul-de-sac in the middle of nature. It was beautiful and the sun going down behind the mountain. That was a real special moment. I think there were multiple at the harbour, um, but everywhere we went, there was one thing that stood out. So to have one moment, I can't say, but just being around the guys, having fun, laughing. Uh, it's amazing that you can put 14 people together, one lady, 13 men, and uh, Oaks still get on, you know? It was yeah. just one of those twists. Everyone got on. I don't think there were any times we were really angry or cross or... We had lots of challenges, but I think we just took the challenges head on. Weather-wise, yeah. um, we, we weren't blessed with great weather and we still made it work. In fact, I think the weather did actually work with the sun going... Makes it more dramatic uh, with that lighting. It, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, talking about that thing there by the mountain with Stacy. I know James was panicking because it was overcast, the sun was going down, and we were all like, just wait, yeah. just wait, let's just see what happens. And all of a sudden, the sun comes from behind the clouds, one of the most amazing scenes, epic shots. and was epic. And it's just, uh, it, it just comes down to being in the right place, but being patient with what you need to get. I did Jim, say enjoying surfing with you was quite cool too. That was a real that was well, fun. I mean, cool moment. We've never done it before. And never. that's where the like, movie started out in our minds was uh, we watched this 1982 or 1966 remake 82 movie called Endless Summer. And that's where the idea for Jafari oh, came Brown from. Was amazing, man. Yeah, initially. So that I, was a great moment for us. Yeah. I, I love taking you guys surfing. I just yeah. got very uncomfortable when you started telling me about <laughs> the, 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 the dolphins. Yeah, you know, dolphins and their and their mating habits. And yes. No, that was because of this guy. I thought maybe that's why he wanted to go surfing. He's never <laughs> wanted to be a dolphin so much in his in his life. But listen, the, the, there was a special moment when you were flying the drone while we were learning to surf. Do you remember that moment? 
No, no, uh, you're not going yeah. there, Morris. <laughs> 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 no, <we> should, <laughs> you should mention it. Uh, just okay, as a side story. I could be That's wrong <laughs> not to now. Yeah, there were so many side stories. This was a good one. So, flying the drone, and now on the drone, you've got the little green box, which you push on the person, that's where it focuses. So I was actually using a, a feature called Active Track. So it would kind of just assist me and track the, the, the person slash object in the shot. And uh, <laughs> for, so, for some reason, when I clicked on Jim to track Jim, it put a little boat symbol next, <laughs> next to the box. And it didn't do it for anyone else in the water. And I was a little bit shocked by this. I didn't know how it changed the dynamic of the joy. And I was a little bit concerned. Pick me up as a boat. <laughs> Jim, can, can I tell you, we, we, we all laugh. Because that is one thing, like with you guys, it is always fun. I just watched watching you guys squeezing into wetsuits. Oh, man. <laughs> and the banter that went down there was awesome. But I want to pick up. It's not about ripping each other off and whatever. But no, it I is. Think, I, think a lot, <laughs> I think a lot of why this thing works so well is that the two of you, as Mike and Jim, have walked a road together for a very, very long time and you trust each other and you know how to get through things and, and making a plan. At the end of the day, the result always works. I think it's cool for you, James, to slot into, to slot into something like yeah, that. I think being in events, Marius, yeah. your kind of second job is crisis management. So for all sure. the time we're putting out fires, you know, creating new plans to get around hurdles or obstacles or whatever the case may be. So. You know, it's, I mean, it's tribute to putting like-mindedness and different ideas together in perspectives and then coming up with a solution and running with it. Whether it's wrong or right, it doesn't really matter. It's got to work, that's yeah. the bottom line. It has and to happen. 95% of the time it works, so yeah. it was really good. The dynamic was amazing. Well, guys, I just, uh, congratulations, seriously. I, for me, that was beautiful television to watch. Super proud. You guys put it together. Well done for what you did in editing yeah, that. This guy's been a saint. He's, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. a trooper and and handled everything that we've thrown at him. And, and we threw him in the deep end. We really did. Yeah. We threw him in the deep end and he's, he's come out swimming like a dolphin. <laughs> uh, season two is going to be Danny, no longer James. <laughs> Danny the dolphin. But, but I promise you, I just think storytelling is key. And that's what you guys did here. You told a story in a really fresh and extremely creative way. So Drift Fari 2 for sure. Without yeah. a doubt, I think we've got a plan in mind to, uh, to do something different, but yeah. to make it relevant and continue the story. Awesome, guys. Yeah. Listen, if you haven't seen Drafari, it had its, uh, its first season run on, uh, on Ignition, but uh, it is available on YouTube uh, as well. We'll put up all the links for that. That is it for this week's show. Let's have a look at what you can look forward to next week here on Motor Driven. It's a super focused and fired up Tasman Pepper chatting to us about the year ahead. What is all the fuss about? I finally get to drive the Suzuki Ignis. From drifting this week to spinning next week with the Soweto Drift Academy.